What up guys, my name is Stan from Random Tens, and I just want to thank every single person who subscribed to this YouTube channel. And in honor of Random Tens reaching 50,000 subscribers, I think it's time we finally do what our name implies and give you guys a top 10 video that I've been saving for a special occasion. So without further delay, here are my top 10 favorite Pokemon of all time. Number 10. If there's something I can promise you guys over the course of this countdown, it'd have to be diversity. There's Pokemon from a variety of different types, regions, colors, and everything in between. It's not like I chose Pokemon that would stick out on purpose, these just happen to be the 10 that have had the biggest impact on me over the 18 years I've been obsessed with the franchise. And so in the number 10 spot, we have my favorite legendary Pokemon, Lugia. I imagine that I probably still have a lot of love for this psychic flying type because it was the mascot Pokemon on the cover of the first game in the series I ever owned, Pokemon Silver. You couple that with the fact that I can still remember going to see Pokemon 2000 in theaters for my 7th birthday and I think my nostalgia is way too strong to ignore this one. I've never really been one to use it in battle and I think objectively that they've created far better legendary designs since Ho-Oh and Lugia, but at the end of the day just looking at this creature transports me back to my childhood and sometimes that's enough to cement it as meaningful in some way. Although I still don't agree with its confusing typing. I mean, it lives in the deep sea in like every single incarnation, so why the heck isn't it at least partially a water type? Never made sense to me as a kid and still doesn't make sense to me today. Number 9 From a pocket monster that I always mistake for a water type, to one of only two actual water types to make my top 10, this next gen 1 Pokemon is one that sort of took me by surprise and definitely grew on me over time. It was featured in the popular anime, but not to the extent of a Pikachu or a Charizard. Its design is in my opinion one of the most classic the series has ever churned out, but it's definitely not a breath of fresh air by any means, and finally it's actually pretty common across multiple generations of games, so long as you know how to fish. So what Pokemon am I talking about? The one and only Staryu of course. One of my favorite aspects about Gen 1 is its emphasis on the theme of technology versus nature, and how many of the Pokemon from that generation look like normal animals or objects that may have gotten a boost in power from science or through gene manipulation. And personally, I think that Staryu and to some degree its evolution Starmie are a great embodiment of those themes. It's sort of this incredible design where you see what might happen if some crazy billionaire like Bill Gates wanted to create a cybernetic starfish, and seeing the bright red jewel in the center of its body always gave me some serious HAL 9000 vibes, at least in the last few years. It's not a perfect Pokemon by any means, and I don't even really have strong memories with it like I do Lugia, I just really love this design, and sometimes that's good enough for the number 9 spot. Number 8 this next Pokemon is one that I've actually gotten really familiar with over the past few years, and despite my lack of competitive prowess, this is the sort of monster I always make sure I keep around in my party in case some random player on the PSS wants to have a spontaneous battle. It's intimidating, it's bulky, and it's one of my favorite designs to come out of Gen 5. In the number 8 spot, it's Ferrothorn. I know it's useless against fire types, but my personal strategy is always to keep it until my very last Pokemon, which will hopefully allow me to take down my opponent's fire type specialist and then let this steel grass tank plant its roots, decrease its speed with curse, and spam gyro ball until the sun comes up. I actually hatched a near perfect shiny Ferrothorn during my post game adventures in X and Y, and although much better players can usually figure out my strategy and destroy me with no problems, there's something so satisfying about watching that one person who's not prepared slowly come to terms with the realization that this Pokemon is practically untouchable. And because I have so much fun with it, Ferrothorn is definitely one of my favorite Pokemon of all time. Number 7 as a bit of a nerdy person, I often get asked the age-old question, if you could have any superpower, which one would it be? Now, there's a lot of great choices out there, but for me it's always a toss-up between two distinctive power sets. Some sort of waterbending like Katara in Avatar, or the ability to wield and become living electricity like Anil from One Piece. So with that in mind, it's probably a no-brainer that one of my favorite Pokemon ever created is the water-lightning hybrid, Lantern. This light Pokemon sort of checks off all of the boxes for me, with its unique typing, adorable dolphin-like design, and being a semi-scarce Pokemon in the first generation of games I ever played. 
Being a member of both water and electric type families, it's also a pretty good ally to have during any series playthrough, as it has 5 resistances and only 2 weaknesses, as well as the best HP stat across all electric Pokemon. I'm aware that Lantern's not for everybody, but for whatever reason it speaks to me, and might I add, it also has my favorite color scheme across the entire series. Don't get me wrong, I love other electric types like Raichu, Ampharos, and Manetric, but for some reason, even all of these years later, Lantern is still both my favorite water and electric type pocket monster. Your move, Gen 7. Number 6. I think that this next Pokemon is my personal favorite shiny in the history of the franchise. I know that that really shouldn't have any bearings on what makes a Pokemon stand out or not, but as a collector of sorts, sometimes it creeps into my thought process when choosing my team. Regardless of its shiny form though, there's no denying that Bisharp is just a well-designed Pokemon. As many of you already know, my favorite Pokemon typing is Dark, and being the only Dark Steel type Pokemon, along with its pre-evolution, put this Pokemon on my radar the second I saw a Ponyard in my copy of Pokemon White. And though I also think Ponyard is a great member of any team, it wasn't until mine evolved into Bisharp that I was really floored. And circling back around to its shiny incarnation, just look how much cooler this Blade Pokemon looks in blue. If the last entry didn't tip you off, I really love a good blue and yellow color scheme when it's done right, and Bisharp's shiny definitely stands out in my mind. In fact, the first Pokemon I bred after obtaining the shiny charm in X and Y was Bisharp, and after around 250 eggs, I was rewarded with a perfect weapon of speed and attack I named Aerobolt. At this point, I feel like my inner child is showing just a little too much, so I'll try to wrap it up. But what can I say? Bisharp is one of the most badass Pokemon Game Freaks ever designed, and it's absolutely one of my go-tos in any playthrough I can put it on my team. Number 5 if you've seen my video on the top 7 dragon Pokemon, then this next entry probably won't surprise you. In fact, my personal favorite dragon is right there in the thumbnail. That's right, I'm a massive fan of Gudra, but before I even knew that this creature existed, there was only Gumi. I won't lie, before Gen 6 was officially released, I was scouring online forums trying to spoil every single detail X and Y had in store for me. I can promise you this won't be the case for Sun and Moon, but at the very least I can say one good thing came from it, and that was that it sold me on the slimy dragon from the get-go. Before I knew it would become a pseudo-legendary Pokemon, I just thought it was an inventive looking design, and like many I also thought it was equal parts ridiculous and adorable. And so when I finally stumbled upon one in the swamps of Route 14, I used my Premier Ball and the rest is history. That same Gumi would eventually grow into the awesome Gudra, and its deep move pool would help my team overcome the Kalos Elite 4 in one overpowered run. I eventually reset this save file for a second playthrough, but you'd better believe that before I did, I transferred my Paragu along with a few other friends to Neon's copy of Y. I still have my beloved Goo Dragon today, and as you can imagine, I plan on bringing this particular Pokemon along with me via the Pokebank to every future generation that I possibly can. And that loyalty, ladies and gentlemen, is why Gumi takes the number 5 spot. Number 4 For those of you keeping score at home, I've already explained why Lugia is my favorite legendary of all time, but I didn't say anything about my favorite mythical or event Pokemon. These are the creatures that are normally impossible to obtain legally in the games, but through some miracle I was almost always fortunate enough that as a kid someone would trade me theirs. They were probably hacked or cloned or whatever else people would say to me in hopes of tempering my enthusiasm, but trust me when you're 7 years old and you have a Mew in your original copy of Silver, nothing can ruin your fun. I was always one of those kids that preferred Mew to Mewtwo, which at the time sort of made me a target on the playground, because let's face it, Mewtwo was sort of an anti-hero that was marketed in the anime to appeal to young boys, whereas Mew was just a touch more effeminate, at least when compared to its more powerful clone. But the truth was that I just really liked rare things. I still do. And to me and millions of other fans who grew up during the late 1990s, Mew is the embodiment of rarity in the Pokemon universe. So you can probably imagine that when my older friend David traded me a Mew in early 2001 at a time when most people my age barely knew how to read, let alone use a Game Shark, my classmates pretty much stopped making fun of me for my love of the pink cat-like Pokemon and quickly started asking me if I'd clone them a Mew using the PC glitch. And to this day, seeing a Mew still reminds me of all the fun I had playing Pokemon with David, as well as not to care too much about what most people think, which is admittedly a great lesson to know when attempting to entertain thousands of folks on the internet. Number 3 
you always remember your first Pokemon. That's a sentiment shared by almost every fan of the series, and in my opinion, it's sort of undeniable. In fact, the first Pokemon I ever got to call my own is still to this day among my top three favorite Pokemon, and if you watched my previous subscriber celebration video, you also know that Cyndaquil is my favorite starter Pokemon of all time. To summarize why it's my favorite starter, basically Pokemon Silver helped me through a rough time in my life when I was a kid, and with Cyndaquil as my first Pokemon in that game, even the mention of it brings back bittersweet memories and how I cope with my stress at the time. Of course, whatever I thought was stress then was simply just a part of growing up in life, but at an impressionable time, it felt like this adorable fire type was there for me, and sometimes when you're a kid, that's all you need. If you want to hear the full story on my love for Cyndaquil, please feel free to check out my top 10 favorite starter Pokemon video from a while back. I'll put a link at the end of this video, so it'll be very easy if you'd like to really know what makes Cyndaquil so important to me. But for now, let's continue with this countdown to see which monsters could somehow make it even higher. Number 2 Before I reveal the number 1 spot, I think it's time for a little story. Ever since my high school days, I've sort of had a hard time keeping friends. Now, I don't want to play victim, and admittedly a lot of this comes from my own personal attitude and flaws, but yeah, for whatever reason, I'm not always the best guy to have as a friend. I'm working on it though, and in the past few years I like to think I've become much better at reciprocating kindness and whatnot, but there's been many times when I fall into what seems like a perpetual cycle of self-doubt because of my hard times with friends, and one of those times happened to be a few months after Pokemon X and Y launched. During the spring of 2014, most of the few friends I had left were either still in school, traveling with their significant others, or to put it bluntly, just didn't really want to hang out with me. At the time, I'd just finished my first year of college, and besides working at Walmart, I really didn't have much of a social life. And yes, I'm perfectly aware of how sad that sounds. Needless to say, I was in a pretty unhappy place, and so I did what I do most of the times I'm feeling down, and turned to a video game. And in this case, that game was Pokemon X. As I mentioned in a previous entry on this countdown, it was here that I decided to start a new save file using a 100% Eeveelution team. But the unfortunate problem in that plan is the fact that Eevee and its 8 evolutions can't use the HM move fly, which would have made the adventure pretty frustrating. So rather than constantly switch my party around in the PC, I made the decision to use 5 evolutions instead, and immediately caught the first bird Pokemon I came across, which during this playthrough happened to be a Fletchling. And to make a long story only a little bit longer, that playthrough was really meaningful to me because it was the first time I completed the National Pokédex in any main series game, and being the only creature in my party that wasn't an evolution, I grew pretty attached to my eventual Talonflame. So when I finally did complete the Pokédex months after starting that new save file and wanted to breed my own shiny competitive team, my second choice after Bisharp was Fletchling, and after 400 eggs I finally hatched one. What I didn't mention though was that during the few months it took me to do all of this, I actually made an effort to be a lot more social. I can't remember exactly how it started, or if it was simply out of some sort of desperation, but I started going to weekly melee tournaments with a small group of friends, I cut out a lot of the few negative people I had left in my life, and I also began working out with my buddy Rob, who taught me a lot about what perseverance and friendship really means. And so an early summer break that started terribly ended up becoming the best few months I've ever had in terms of making memories, and throughout it all I stayed true to my goal and finally caught them all. And now whenever I think of the best summer ever, I can't help but picture Talonflame along with all of those wonderful memories and of course the wonderful friends who helped make them with me. So yeah, that's sort of a long drawn out way of explaining why Talonflame is my second favorite Pokemon of all time. Number 1 I promise you that this next entry is nowhere near as sappy as the last three. In fact, the story behind my favorite Pokemon of all time is actually fairly boring by comparison. So now that you've made it this far, let's talk about the Pokemon you've all been waiting for. I'm actually not sure why or how this Gen 2 Dark type became my absolute favorite in the series, but I do know the seed was planted early. I accidentally evolved Bill's Eevee into an Umbreon during my first playthrough of Pokemon Silver, but I know for a fact that because I was overleveling my starter, like most kids do with their first Pokemon games, I didn't pay much attention to the rest of my team, including that Umbreon. No, it wasn't until Gen 5, over a decade later, that I finally understood what everyone else saw in this often overexposed pocket monster. 
I couldn't tell you how, but at some point during my post-game adventure in white version, I acquired an Umbreon, possibly to EV train it, thinking that it would make a great foil to my good friend Neon's Psychic-type team. Unfortunately for me, all of that training proved useless, because I found out during our first real battle that my good friend Neon actually loves fighting types, and so investing in an Umbreon proved absolutely worthless. But a few months later, when I finally picked up Black 2, I decided to use that well-trained Umbreon to breed a baby Eevee that I would trade over and start my adventure in that game with. And as it turned out, possibly by coincidence or possibly because I'm a lifelong Night Owl, I ended up evolving it into an even stronger Umbreon than its father had ever been. Today, this Umbreon is one of the few Pokemon I've single-handedly raised to level 100, and I've taken down many friends and foe alike with its sometimes annoying moveset. So admittedly, I wish I had a better or more emotional reasoning for it topping the list, but sometimes there's just a certain Pokemon that catches you off guard and sort of becomes connected to you for the rest of your adventures. There's Ash and Pikachu, Lance and his three Dragonites, and now I guess Stan and his Umbreon. And honestly, I'm pretty happy with that. So there you have it, my top 10 favorite Pokemon of all time. I know this may seem like a bit of a big video to make, especially for 50,000 subscribers, but after all you guys have done for me, now just sort of felt like the perfect time. Either way, please let me know who your favorite Pokemon is and why in the comment section below. Follow us on Twitter, at Random10s, if you feel so inclined, and as I always say, happy hunting, baby rhinos.